Voting is a right here in America. Much like you have the right to free speech and the right to a firearm, you also have the right to vote. Though it used to be viewed more as a privilege, and we still kind of think of it that way. If you try to introduce a new rule that maybe curtails a few people from voting, aside from those few people affected, most other people don't seem to care. They might even be in favor of those rules. The only way to stop these rules from taking effect is to vote. So please, vote, assuming you still can. This video is brought to you by Skillshare. When America was founded, or rather a few years later when the Constitution went into effect, only white male Protestants over the age of 21, who also owned a not insignificant amount of land, were allowed to vote. When George Washington was elected in 1789, only 6% of the US population had the right to vote. Much like the definition of a citizen, the right to vote was both expanded and restricted over the years. By the 1840s, the property ownership requirement had disappeared. Then in 1870, after the bloodiest war in American history, history, the white requirement was removed by the 15th Amendment, allowing black males the right to vote. We had some issues with letting Asians and Native Americans vote, but that was cleared up later. In 1920, the 19th Amendment granted women the right to vote federally. Certain states had allowed it previously. And lastly, in 1971, the 26th Amendment was passed, lowering the voting age to 18. So that's it. As long as you're a US citizen over the age of 18, you're allowed to vote. And now, you know better. Wait. Yeah, if only it were that simple. States decide who gets to vote, so aside from those few amendments I mentioned, we have no uniform federal rules. So every time the federal government extended the right to vote to a group, new state rules were put in place to limit how many people in that group could actually vote. Like after the Mexican-American War. When we annexed all that new territory with all those new people, America had a problem because at the time, Mexican people were still classified as white. So English literacy became a requirement, and it remained a requirement that was rather famously used to deny black people the right to vote for another 100 years under Jim Crow. Along with poll taxes, which meant you had to pay a fee every time you voted, which were eliminated by the 24th Amendment. It's a common misconception that felony disenfranchisement was started during Reconstruction, or Jim Crow, in order to suppress the African American vote. Felony disenfranchisement means that you lose the ability to vote if you've committed a certain level of crime. The idea is that you broke the social contract so you shouldn't be allowed to participate in decisions that help shape that society or its rules. And you could argue that that makes sense for a little while, but forever? Forever ever? Forever ever? We've actually had these rules since basically the beginning. Kentucky was the first state to enact criminal disenfranchisement in 1792, followed by Vermont in 1793, then Ohio, and Louisiana. By the time the Civil War came around, most states in the North and South had some form of felony disenfranchisement. In fact, during Reconstruction, only one state expanded felony disenfranchisement in order to stop black people from voting. Can you guess which one? It's Alabama. I mean, come on. Their constitution still has a rather long list of people who are disqualified from voting, including all idiots and insane persons. <laughs> what? That's off to a great start. It should be noted that idiot was a medical term back then, but Man, that has not aged well. But here's the list of crimes that disqualify you. Those who shall be convicted of treason, murder, arson, embezzlement, malfeasance in office, larceny, receiving stolen property, obtaining property or money under false pretenses, perjury, subordination of perjury, robbery, assault with intent to rob, burglary, forgery, bribery, assault and battery on life, bigamy, living in adultery, sodomy, incest, rape, miscegenation. If you needed any more proof that this was racially motivated, here you go. Miscegenation is marrying outside of your race. If a black man married a white woman, neither of them were allowed to vote. That section of the Constitution wraps up with a blanket statement. Or any crime punishable by imprisonment in the penitentiary, or of any infamous crime, or crime involving moral turpitude. An infamous crime is usually defined as a felony. Many of the crimes on that list were retracted over time, but the felony part has not. Felony disenfranchisement on the whole is starting to disappear in the country as people start to realize that punishing someone for life well after their sentence 
was a bit much. In Maine and Vermont, there is no disenfranchisement. People are allowed to vote while in prison. These states allow you to vote once you're out of prison, and these states after probation or parole. These states allow you to vote after your sentence, but only for first-time offenders or nonviolent crimes. It varies by state. But in these four states, no felon of any kind ever gets to vote Ever. But ever, ever? Yes. Well, unless the governor personally restores your rights and the next governor doesn't immediately reverse that decision. Florida has the chance to change their color on that map in the election on Tuesday. But as felony disenfranchisement has been disappearing, a new form of voter suppression seems to be emerging. When you register to vote, you have to prove who you are and where you live. But some states are now requiring a separate ID when you actually vote. Voter ID laws are one of those things that just feels like it makes sense. But the facts don't seem to line up with those feelings. Another example of this would be drug testing people people on welfare. It costs way more than it saves. A common argument for voter ID is that you need one for all sorts of other things. You can barely get by without one. So it makes sense that you should have to prove who you are before you go vote. On the surface, that sounds reasonable, which is probably why a majority of Americans support the idea. Except you don't really need an ID for all sorts of other things unless you're a teenager. I couldn't tell you the last time I had to show anyone my ID. Not to get into an R-rated movie, or buy spray paint, or even alcohol. If I lived in a city that had decent public transportation, I probably wouldn't need an ID at all. Well, you need one to work, right? No, not really, no. When you got hired, your HR person gave you this list and you probably just handed over your driver's license and social security card. But there's about a dozen other options available. And here's the kicker, those dozen other options, depending on the state, aren't valid voter IDs. 11% of Americans do not have a valid voter ID. I have an ID, and if you thought that me saying I can't remember the last time I had to show anyone my ID is far-fetched, 35 million Americans don't have an ID and seem to get along just fine. Except when it comes to this new rule about voting. If you lost your driver's license, it would be a pain. You'd have to take a few hours off of work, go to the DMV, sit there for a few hours, pay a fee, and then wait six to eight weeks for it to arrive in the mail. It would be a whole thing. But you can justify it because you need it to drive. But if you take the bus to work every day and everything is fine, but now you find out you have to do all of that stuff in order to go vote when you didn't two years ago, you're probably just not going to vote. Voter ID laws vary by state, but there are currently 17 states with rather strict voter ID laws. The usual reasoning behind these laws is to stop voter fraud, and we've been told a lot in the last few years that voter fraud is a big problem, and the integrity of our ballot box is paramount. I'm not going to address the claim that millions of illegal immigrants are voting, because no they aren't. That's ridiculous. But in most states that either have passed or are trying to pass voter ID laws, someone will claim that hundreds of dead people are voting. An analysis of recent elections in the state, ready for this, shows that 953 dead people voted. After the investigation was complete, they found that only five ballots couldn't be accounted for out of the 1.3 million votes that were cast. But using that pretense, South Carolina still passed voter ID laws. Voter ID laws really only stop voter impersonation. That is, you going to the polls and claiming to be someone that you're not and casting a vote. Between 2000 and 2014, there have only been 31 cases of that happening in the entire United States. Again, using voter fraud as a pretense, Texas passed one of the strict voter ID laws in the country, disenfranchising 600,000 people. Between 2002 and 2014, only two people have been convicted of voter fraud in Texas. Imagine for a moment, over the course of 12 years, two people committed a crime with an AR-15. And as a result, the state took away 600,000 AR-15s from people who did nothing wrong. Not permanently, don't worry, you can get it back. You just need to take some time off work, go to the state ID office, wait for a few hours, pay a fee, and wait for it to arrive in the mail a few weeks later. This isn't that much of a stretch. Voting is a right just as much as owning a firearm. Texas has one of the most interesting and strictest voter ID laws in the country. The issue isn't that you need an ID, it's which IDs count. Most people have some form of ID to work or go to school or whatever, but those don't count in Texas. Wisconsin allows school IDs, which makes sense. It's a state-run government institution. But Texas doesn't. You know what does count? a concealed carry permit. I can't imagine any difference between people who carry CCLs and people who carry school IDs. Huh. And here's where we get to talk about discrimination. Voter ID laws are often described as useless since it solves a problem that isn't really a problem. 
but also racist, which usually makes people defensive and use some of the arguments that I've already mentioned. Again, the problem isn't that you need an ID, it's which IDs count as valid voter IDs. As I said before, 11% of all Americans don't have a valid voter ID. Only 8% of white Americans don't have one, while 25% of African Americans don't have one. These laws disproportionately affect poor people who also tend to be minorities. Anyone has the legal ability to go get a state-issued ID, provided they have the necessary paperwork like their original birth certificate or proof of name change. But not everyone has the financial ability to do so. Even if the ID itself was free, if you have to take off work for several hours to go get an ID when you didn't need an ID to get to work or do anything else, that might not be a cost that you're willing to pay in order to go vote. Which is why some people claim that it's effectively a new form of poll tax. It's an unnecessary barrier to voting that didn't exist before and won't really solve any problem. Using a fake ID to vote will be just as easy as using one to buy alcohol. It won't stop the small amount of voter fraud that exists, but it does stop minorities from voting. Let's take a look at North Carolina. You'll notice that it doesn't currently have any voter ID laws because it was struck down by the courts. Although the new provisions target African Americans with almost surgical precision, they constitute inapt remedies for the problems, assertively justifying them, and in fact, impose cures for problems that don't exist. The North Carolina legislature pulled racial voter voting data and crafted the law around that to purposefully disenfranchise African American voters with, what did they call it? Surgical precision. With race data in hand, the legislature amended the bill to exclude many of the alternative photo IDs used by African Americans. As amended, the bill retained only the kinds of IDs that white North Carolinians were more likely to possess. If you needed any more proof that voter ID is discriminatory, that should do it. It's not that you need an ID, it's which ones count. Why do you think Texas allows CCLs but not school IDs? But that's not all they did. They discovered that a lot of African American voters used same day registration, so they got rid of that. They also cut early voting from 17 days down to just 10, because that racial data indicated that a lot of African American voters tended to vote early during those first seven days, which eliminated a souls to the poll day when churches would bus people to go vote. Do I need to tell you who used that? Likewise, in every state that has voter ID laws, you only need to present an ID if you vote in person, not if you do a mail-in or absentee ballot. Guess who that favors? There's a trend here. When you register to vote, you have to identify yourself and show some sort of proof of residence to establish your address. Usually a utility bill or a lease. Seems simple enough. But when North Dakota passed a law requiring every registered voter to have a valid street address, they effectively disenfranchised Native Americans who live on reservations. Because the post office still hasn't gotten around to giving them physical addresses. Even if you have an address, you're registered to vote, and you have a driver's license or state-issued ID, you may go to the polls and find out that you've been purged. Which is exactly what happened in Georgia a few weeks ago. Brian Kemp, who is running for governor and also happens to be the current Secretary of State, purged almost half a million people from the voter rolls, 70% of which were African American. One of the justifications is that they didn't pass an exact match which requires all state documents to have the exact same spelling and spacing of your full name and address. They used computers for this, of course. No one's gonna go through all those documents by hand. And they could have learned how to program those computers by going to skl.sh slash knowingbetter3. Skillshare is an online learning community with classes taught by experts in their field. Learn C++ from scratch in this set of courses and realize that missing a space in your address isn't the only thing that can ruin your life or learn how to make Java stop telling me that there's an update available, or choose from 20,000 other classes to purge whatever lack of knowledge you have from your voter rolls. So head over to skl.sh slash knowingbetter3 to get two months of unlimited access to all of Skillshare's courses for free, and you'll be supporting the channel when you do. He did this after the voter registration deadline, so you won't be able to fix this before election day. People were also purged for not voting in previous elections. Most states have something like this, known as use it or lose it. You're removed from the voter rolls for not voting in the previous general, midterm, or sometimes even off-year elections. Yes, there are off-year elections. There's an election literally every November. Many of these laws have good-sounding intentions on their surface, but background negative consequences. They may not always have nefarious intent, but they will have nefarious effect. It is your duty as an informed citizen to think about these intents and consequences, especially if it affects people who might not have the right to vote like you, because now you know better.
Go vote! If you heard nothing else during this video, please vote. I'd like to give a shout out to my newest legendary patron, Darren. If you'd also like your name to fly across the screen too fast for anyone to read it, head on over to patreon.com knowingbetter. Don't forget to register that subscribe button, follow me on Twitter and Facebook, and join us on the subreddit.